This is the ABC through 3LO Melbourne. Heavens, you woke me. I heard someone moving. I thought your mother might be ill. It, it was a horrible dream. Horrible. Go back to bed. Uh, yes, Helen. Of course. <gasps> Richard! What is it? In your hand. A knife. You're holding a knife. The BBC presents... A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell, and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Sleepwalker. Oh, who can that be at this time of night? One good way to find out, Miss Frail, would be to answer it. Oh, hello? This is Dr. Morell's house. Hello? Hello? Well, who is it? Well, there's no one there. Well, in that case, hang up, and we'll proceed with my work. Oh, I do wish people wouldn't do that. It makes me feel quite creepy. Probably a burglar uh, casing the joint. Doing what, Doctor? Uh, surely you've heard that underworld expression before. Uh, the burglar telephones the house he's selected uh, to discover if it's unoccupied or not. Quite the usual procedure. Oh, but I'm sure no burglar would dream of robbing you. They know you too well. I'm not quite sure whether to feel flattered or not. Oh, well, you know what I mean. Anyway, I believe you're only trying to scare me. If I may continue with my dictating. Yes, Dr. Morell. Uh, where were we? Well, I was propounding uh, that every criminal is actuated by a compulsive urge to encompass his own doom. In each human being, the seeds of death are implanted from the moment of birth. And in order to destroy himself, uh, the evildoer deliberately seeks to draw attention to his crime. Well, I know, I... You know, I still don't see that. No, Miss Frey... Possibly because your comprehension of the psychology of the criminal is not so profound as mine. Oh, of course. You know it all. You are saying... Nothing, Doctor. Nothing. It is only by this understanding of the criminal psychology and knowledge of the principles that govern psychiatric behavior uh, that the police investigator can hope to operate with any success. Now, take, for instance, that case of sleepwalking, which I made comparatively short work of. Oh, that odd young man. Richard Wilson, you mean? Yes, a classic example of what I have in mind, the culprit's self-betrayal. Mm, it was one morning early this year, I remember, when he came to see you by appointment. Uh, this is Mr. Wilson, Dr. Morell. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Thank you, Miss Frail. Uh, sit down, Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you. It's very good of you to see me so quickly. You have my assistant, Miss Frail, to thank. It was her I spoke to yesterday on the phone and made the appointment. A somewhat impressionable young woman, inclined to be influenced by an appeal to the emotions. Well, I did make it sound rather urgent. A matter of life and death was Miss Frail's description. You see, It Doc... was upon her insistence that it was a case of such urgency uh, that I agreed to see you. I'm very grateful to Miss Frail, and if I did sound so worked up, well, it, it could be a matter of life and death. For whom, Mr. Wilson? For you? No, Dr. Morell. It's my mother. I'm afraid that I'm going to murder her. Do you care to smoke? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks. Try to relax, Mr. Wilson. And let me reassure you that it isn't altogether unusual for children to wish their parents dead. And sometimes to the extent that they become horrified... Uh, that they may transform the thought into action. I'm not a child, Dr. Morell. Uh, quite. Uh, but there are few adults who are not inhibited by some hangover of childhood influences. Well, I myself, for instance, 
I've never been able to rid myself of the infantile compulsion uh, to slide my finger along the banister when ascending or descending a staircase. Oh, really? Merely a manifestation by my subconscious of some childhood yearning, real or imaginary, for security. Well, I'm sure my childhood was secure enough. Uh, by the way, Mr. Wilson, I, I would prefer it if you didn't mention this little... Uh, eccentricity of mine to Miss Frail? No, of course I won't. It might appeal to her as a matter for some levity. Uh, I understand. Well, I had a happy home, a fine school and university. I'm, I'm doing well now. I'm, I'm an architect by profession. And your age? 33. Married? Uh, no. Is your father alive? No, he died when I was a child. And you live with your mother? Yes, I designed our house, as a matter of fact, in Hampstead, overlooking the heath. Mother and I have always got along famously in... Well, since I hadn't married, there was no reason for me to have a place of my own. And you now find yourself suffering from an obsessive fear that you will kill your mother. For the past three months, I've been having these ghastly nightmares. They've always been the same sort of dream? Yes, that I've got to kill her, murder her. Then last night I had this dreadful dream again, and I woke up outside her bedroom. I'd walked in my sleep. I was holding a knife, a stiletto that I use as a paper knife. If I hadn't been awoken, I'm sure I should have gone in and, and stabbed her. Murder your mother whilst walking in your sleep. An interesting possibility. Though I'm bound to say I've never encountered such a case in all my experience. I shall do it. I know it. You, you, you must help me. But you've always awakened from your dream in time. Except last night I didn't. Someone else woke me. I was just going to enter mother's room, holding the knife, and, and then Helen, uh, Miss Keene, mother's secretary companion, sh she heard me. She woke you? Yes, thank heaven she did. Uh, otherwise I should... I'm quite sure that you would have woken up yourself, as you've done before. But supposing I hadn't, Doctor, supposing I had stabbed her, I'd have been guilty of murder. Well, as to that, uh, no court of law would find you guilty of a crime when you were not responsible for your actions. But, of course, I didn't come to you just to know that. Look, I'm terrified, I tell you, that I shall kill my own mother. You would describe yourself as close to each other? Oh, yes, that's why I simply can't understand these nightmares. And now, last night... It's possible that you may have sleepwalked on previous occasions... And return to your own bedroom without you or anyone else being any the wiser. I, I see. I, I hadn't thought of that. Mm -hmm. Have you contemplated becoming married? Uh, no. Uh, well, that is, I, I am in love with someone. And who is in love with you? I think so. Yes. Yes, she is. And have you asked her to marry you? Not yet. I... Do you wish to marry her? Yes. And she wants to marry you? Yes. Then... Well, you see, it's... That is, my mother. Look, what's all this got to do with it? Helen understands. Helen... Your mother's secretary companion? Yes. How long have you been in love with each other? Well, I suppose it began a year ago. A few months after Helen came, although I didn't realize it at the time. When did you realize it? About four months ago. She told me she loved me too. And she understood that you couldn't have married her while your mother was alive. Well, how did you... You explained that she was a very understanding young woman. Look, I came to consult you about these horrible dreams. What's Helen got to do with it? Everything. You want to marry. You can't because you know it will upset your mother. In effect... Uh, your mother stands between you and your personal happiness. Subconsciously, you are aware of this, and though you try to repress this nagging truth, it confronts you in your dreams and nightmares in which you can remove the obstacle to your happiness. Well, I can't believe it. It doesn't make sense. On the contrary, Mr. Wilson, yours is the most typical case. You mean to say that all I've told you has been brought about by Helen and I falling in love? And because you can't marry for fear of your mother. But surely you can help me. I mean, I thought you would. Make out a prescription... Send you away with a bottle of pills? Well, it isn't as simple as that. I, I don't think... Well, that is... Perhaps I'd better go. I'm very grateful, Dr. Morell, of course, but... Ah, Miss Frey. Yes, Doctor? Mr. Wilson is just going. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. At any rate, you've been able to satisfy yourself on one point. Hmm? What's that? Well, if you should walk in your sleep and kill your mother, you won't be held guilty of murder. Not that, of course, that would happen. Anyway, not in your sleep. <laughs> morning hasn't started before that thing goes. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. I must speak to him. I must... Who is that, please? It's Richard Wilson. I must speak to Dr. Morell. It's dreadfully urgent. Oh, uh, will you hold on, Mr. Wilson? Uh, Dr. Morell, it's Mr. Wilson on the phone. You remember he came to see you about a week ago. Wilson, uh, the sleepwalker with obsessive matricide tendencies? Yes, Dr. Morell. I'll speak to him. Mr. Wilson, uh, Dr. Morell here. Something frightful's happened. Please come at once, Doctor. My mother's dead. She's been murdered. <laughs> A 
wonderful early morning view across Hampstead Heath. Remarkably fine. Mm, you can see St. Paul's glinting in the sunlight. And glimpse the figure of justice above the old bailey. Someone's coming. Dr. Morell? Yes? Please come in. Oh, this is Miss Frail. I am Helen Keane, Mrs. Wilson's secretary companion. Uh, Mr. Wilson is upstairs in his room. I'm afraid you'll find him most dreadfully upset. Oh, how awful for him. And for you, too. Have the police been informed? No. He wanted to see you first. If you'll come upstairs. This way. Dr. Morell? There he is. He heard you arrive. Oh, come up, please. Go on, Dr. Morell and Miss Frail. I'll wait down here. I telephoned you right away, Doctor. This is dreadful. The shock. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson. Miss Keene says that you haven't called the police. I didn't know what to do. Then I thought perhaps I ought to let you know first. Mother's room's along here. What about the servants? Well, the housekeeper doesn't come till ten. There's a daily help who turns up when she feels like it. This is Mother's room. Oh, what a state it's in. This is how it was when I found her. I, I haven't touched anything. Stabbed through the heart. I'm afraid there's nothing can be done. Oh, poor thing. I should think death must have occurred several hours ago. That's the stiletto I told you about. So I observe. Uh, are you all right, Miss Frail? Uh, yes, of course. If you feel a trifle faint... Yes, I know. Just put my head between my knees. I came in as usual at half past eight with her morning cup of tea, and there she was. Uh, then I saw her dressing table had been ransacked, and the window onto the balcony had been forced. Well, her handbag's open, too. Yeah, she, she always kept it there by her bedside. She had a note case, but that's gone. The motive appears obvious enough. She kept her jewellery, in that case it's been thrown on the floor. The, the burglar must have disturbed her. The bedclothes indicate a struggle. Uh, this stiletto, uh, you had it in your possession that night? Uh, yes. What did you do with it subsequently? Well, I was scared to keep it myself. I thought the best thing was to lock it away in Mother's bureau over there. Well, it's been smashed open. And the burglar found it. Only Mother had the key. Dr. Morell. What is it, Miss Frail? In her right hand, look. I had already noted. It appears to be a portion of a man's necktie. The murderer. Oh, she struggled with him, grabbed at his tie, and tore part of it. Yes, a very ordinary tie of a pattern worn by thousands. But still, it's something to go on. Well, it, it, it's not unlike one of my own. Doctor, could, could I have done it? That's why I sent for you. Help me, you must help me. They'll hang me for it. Something I never meant to do. Try to calm yourself. But I must have come in walking in my sleep, broken up in the bureau where I knew the dagger was. But what about the jewellery? Well, probably taken that and hidden it away somewhere. Aren't you forgetting one thing? You were wearing pyjamas. Or do you seriously suggest that you put on a necktie? A portion of which your mother is gripping in her hand? Well, I, of course, I, Mr. Wilson. That's proof well, that you couldn't have done it. You just listen to Dr. Morell. He's always right. Thank you, Miss Frail. Now, if you would listen to me... Yes, Doctor. Go downstairs and telephone the police. Oh, but there's a phone here. Oh, of course. Fingerprints. You are improving, Miss Frail. Oh, am I? Well, I, I'll go and phone Scotland Yard. Uh, Dr. Morell. Yes? Will you tell them about my sleepwalking? I mean, despite what you say, I'm afraid they will suspect me. Uh, since you still seem so concerned, I think we may omit any reference to your somnambulism. Oh, thank you. I'll go and first. It's all right, Miss Fail. I'll go. Oh. Wouldn't it seem better coming from me? Perhaps it would be better for you to phone them. Uh, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got him to ring the police deliberately, didn't you? You've got that look on your face. You are very discerning, Miss Fail. And what does that look signify? Something you want to discuss with me confidentially. Of course. Do you think he's trying to pretend he did it in his sleep? That's what it looks like to me. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but it doesn't look like that to me. It doesn't. You see, closer examination of the necktie indicates that Mrs. Wilson didn't tear it off in a struggle with an assailant. Doesn't it? Now, look for yourself. Oh, I'll take your word for it. Don't be so squeamish. Look. Notice how she grips it, uh, the inside of the tie held against the palm of her hand. Yes. Doesn't that suggest anything to you? No. There are moments, Miss Frail, when I could willingly... However, uh, perhaps a simple demonstration will make my meaning clear. Uh, sit down. Yes, Doctor. Now, I am leaning over you as if... Oh, yes, As Doctor. if about to attack you. Oh! Now, grip my tie with your right hand. Uh, like, like this? Your right hand. Oh, yes, you've made me quite fast. Uh, grip my tie. Like this? Well, do it as if you mean it, as if you know I'm about to murder you, which is a matter of fact. Oh, what, Doctor? <laughs> never mind, never mind. Oh, is this right? You don't... <laughs> you don't really have to strangle me. Oh, sorry. Now, now, do you see how you're holding my tie? Uh, with the outside of it against the palm of my hand. Precisely. Oh, what is it, Dr. Morell? What are you getting at? Well, if my theory is correct, the logical conclusion is 
that the torn-off tie was planted to give a false impression. Gracious. You mean that it wasn't a burglar who murdered her, but someone else? But you just said it wasn't Mr. Wilson. Well, who else, then? That remains to be seen. What is it? I thought I heard someone. Wait. Oh, Doctor. Oh, I was Keen. just making some coffee, and I was wondering whether you'd care for some. Most kind. Thank you. I'd love some. Will you come down, then? The police are on their way, Doctor. Oh, hello, Helen. Very good. The police? I just phoned them. Dr. Morell thought I should. I'm sure he's right. Of course. And you still don't think I have to tell them about walking in my sleep? But, Doctor, you... Yes, think... Miss Frey? Oh, th that'll be the police. Oh, they've been very quick. I'll answer it. What were you going to say, Miss Frey? Oh, oh it, it was nothing. I'm glad of that. Richard! Richard! Hmm? Dr. Morell, look at this. Mother's note case. The one from her handbag. That was the postman. He says he found it in the post box when he was clearing it just now. There's a pillar box a few yards away from the house. I recall passing it on our way here. Look, let, let me look. There's nothing in it. He, he took all the money and pushed this into the pillar box as he passed. That would appear evident. So it was a burglar, all right, just as we thought. But, Doctor, you thought that... Yes, Miss Frail? Oh, Nothing. Your mother's name and address was in it, so the postman brought it back right away. Good. It may be useful to the police. But what about fingerprints, Dr. Morell? Oh, but I expect they will be all blurred. I expect you're right. Here we are, Doctor. Have some coffee before the police really do arrive. Oh. Coffee, Miss Ray? Oh, thank you. Oh, th that must be them this time. I'll go. Now, you finish your coffee, Helen. It looks as if I've been seeing a lot of the police. I might as well start now. <laughs> What's the time? Six o'clock. Hmm. Where is Miss Frail? I must dictate these notes. Uh, this could prove of inestimable value. Uh, Dr. Morell? Ah, Miss Frail. It's Scotland Yard. Inspector Hood is waiting in the study. Eager, no doubt, to reveal that with which I am already I familiar. didn't realize that you would... Come, we mustn't keep our human bloodhound waiting. I thought I'd just drop in, Dr. Morell, on my way back to the yard. I'm very glad you did, Inspector. And now... As I'm sure you've noticed, Miss Frail is all agog to learn the object of your visit. I think I've got some news for you. But first of all, I do want to thank you for your help this morning. That tip-off about the tie, for instance. Well, I don't mind admitting I... I might not have spotted that. Well, I'm sure you would, Inspector. In any case, it was by no means conclusive, as I advised you at the time. Quite so. It merely seemed to indicate that Mrs. Wilson hadn't torn it from an assailant, as it appeared... But it had been planted to give that impression. I demonstrated with Dr. Morell that she would most certainly have gripped the tie differently. Have you arrived at the truth? Have you made an arrest? Hardly, Miss Frail. Oh, but surely, I, I mean, if you knew who committed the crime as well as Dr. Morell. Dr. Morell? Oh, I didn't realize you'd tumble to a doctor. But naturally, he realized who it was right from the start. Well, I'll be... Well, didn't you, Doctor? As usual, Miss Frail has given rein to her imagination, Inspector. I hadn't reached any conclusion this morning. Otherwise, I should, of course, have acquainted you accordingly. I'm sure you would have. Do say who it is. All right, Miss Fale, I'll get down to Casey's. If the doctor doesn't mind listening to what he already knows... The truth can never be too often repeated. Well, it was the tie, really. Once we realized it was a plant, all we had to do was to know who had planted it, then we'd be home and dry. Oh, who did plant now, it? Just coming to that. You must try to curb your impatience, Miss Fale. We scouted round the house and the garden. There were footprints and evidence of a ladder having been placed against the garden wall on the inside to look as if the burglar had got into the garden that way. It was all very cunning. The only mistake was they didn't go far enough. There were no signs of the ladder against the outside wall. Oh, goodness. Goodness had nothing to do with this, Miss Frail. Of course, it was an inside job. That disorder in the bedroom, all very realistically done. But, but the note case in the pillar box. Ah, that was a master touch. I was wondering when you were coming to that. Yes, just the sort of thing a burglar would do. Grab the money, get rid of the note case in the pillar box he was passing. Then who was it who thought up all this? I talked with young Wilson, but he didn't give much away. Understandably, he seemed knocked over by the shock. It was the secretary companion, Miss Keene, who proved most helpful. Who's in love with Mr. Wilson. Oh, Really? I didn't know that. Never mentioned it to me, either of them. Did you ask them? I didn't, as a matter of fact. Hardly seem to be the types to fall in love with each other. He's obviously wrapped up in his mother, and she's the practical, capable type. Absolute opposites. Ah, Inspector, that's where you're not such a good detective. Eh? Not when it comes to investigating the human heart. 
It's just those types who are completely different who fall in love. You think so? Mm Mm-hmm. The nervous young man and the girl all poised and self-assured. The tall woman and the short man, and vice versa. The vague, silly little feather brain and the suave, sardonic man of the world. Don't you agree, Dr. Morell? I can only say that I stand amazed at this revelation of your powers of perception. Yes, I was afraid that was all you would say. Anyway, whether they were in love or not, it's got no bearing on the case. No, Inspector? Not as it's turned out. Miss Keene was very frank. And as a result of what she said, the motive was obvious. Proceed, Inspector. Oh, this is absolutely enthralling. Well, as you know, Mrs. Wilson had been left plenty by her husband when he died. The money was invested in South America. I won't go into the details. She was devoted to her son and he to her. Given him all he wanted. Education, travel, training to be an architect, all the trimmings. Then, suddenly, a few weeks ago, it happened. All her money went up the spout. She awoke one morning to find herself comparatively flat broke. Oh, poor woman. She didn't tell her son. It was he she was most concerned about. He'd only just got going as an architect, and without her financial backing, he was finished before he'd begun. So she decided there was only one thing left for her to do. Alive, she wasn't worth a penny. But she carried life policies to the tune of 20,000 pounds. You mean... That's it, Miss Frail. She was worth more to her son, dead. Oh, how dreadful. Isn't it, Dr. Morell? Hey, Doctor? Hmm? Quite dreadful. Of course, he would collect the lot. But, and this was vital, her policies carried a suicide clause. If Mrs. Wilson committed suicide, they wouldn't pay up a cent. A not unusual stipulation in a life insurance? Quite. Oh, so she deliberately took her own life, but make it look as though she'd been murdered. That way her son would collect. I can't help admiring her. Inspector, uh, you communicated your conclusions to the son? Yes, I broke it to him gently. He didn't take it too well. And Miss Keene, she was also informed? She seemed more prepared for it, but then she knew of Mrs. Wilson's financial state. That poor, desperate woman plotting and scheming like that to kill herself and all for nothing. I should be moved to feel as you do if what the inspector just described to us happened to be true. What? Dr. Morell. What do you mean, Doctor? I mean that Mrs. Wilson did not commit suicide. She was murdered. Here we are, Dr. Morell. Looks very dark. There's a light in the front room. Where Mrs. Wilson used to like to sit. Come on. You wait here, driver. Yes, sir. There'll be a wireless car along any minute. Information room will have told them the drill. Yes, sir. Just tell them we've gone in and I want them to wait outside the front door and keep their eyes peeled. Very good, sir. Let's hope the gate isn't locked. It's all right. Come on. Now, where's the bell push? It's so dark. Ah. It's quite chilly. Would you rather go back and wait in the car? Oh, no. No, I'm going to leave this for you to handle, Dr. Morell. I'll endeavor to be a credit to you. To think that if it hadn't been for you... I... I still can't get over it. The dead cunning of it. Inspector Hood, what brings you back again? Oh, hello, Dr. Morell. Uh, Miss Frail. Good evening. Sorry to disturb you like this. I should have thought you'd seen enough of this house for one day. Not quite, Mr. Wilson, I'm afraid. Well, uh, come on in. Thank you. What is there about all this to interest you, Dr. Morell? Inspector Hood has told you, of course. I have heard his version of the matter. Well, let's go into the front room. Helen's just gone upstairs. So the inspector's version doesn't add up with yours. Is that why you're here? Well, I thought we might have a quiet talk, Mr. Wilson. What have you found out? Something more about poor mother? When you realized her motive for taking her own life, uh, what was your reaction? Well, frankly, I couldn't believe it. I still find it difficult to accept the idea. We've been discussing it, Helen and I. It just doesn't seem like mother. Helen's told me how she made her swear not to tell me about losing her money. I'm afraid she realized that she was very wrong not to tell me, in, in spite of her promise. Why, well, I mean, it would have made it easier for us to marry, I... Mother might have been less difficult about it. No, I didn't know that you and Miss Keene were... Oh, well, I, I didn't mean to mention it, and you didn't ask me. You didn't ask me either, Inspector. 
Helen. Miss Keene. Good evening, Dr. Morell. Miss Frail. Good evening. Good evening, Miss Keene. I heard people arriving, so I came down. I didn't guess it was you. I've been telling Dr. Morell what you and I have been discussing. You mean my promise to your mother? I was just saying how it might have made it easier for you and I to get married. Yes, I heard you. But Dr. Morell, surely you and Inspector Hood, not to mention Miss Frail, aren't here merely to inquire what Richard's reactions were when he knew that his mother committed suicide for his sake. Not altogether, Miss Keene. It would hardly require the three of you just for that. Plus the support of another police car which has just arrived. Oh. Helen. I noticed it on my way downstairs. You don't miss much, Miss Keene. Well, what is all this? Have you got police outside? It concerns the note case in the pillar box. Hmm? Uh, you will recall, Mr. Wilson, uh, that the postman returned it just after ten o'clock this morning after he'd cleared the box. Uh, for your information, the first collection is at 8.30 a.m. Well, what of it? Well, the supposed draggler, who at first was presumed to have murdered your mother, apparently then threw the note case in the pillar box after leaving the house in the early hours. But we know now that there wasn't a burglar. Mother tried to make it look like that. Uh, there wasn't any burglar. Perfectly correct. But, Mr. Wilson, nor could it have been your mother who slipped the note case in the pillar box. Oh, what do you mean? Well, if she had, it must have been found at the time of the first collection at 8.30 a.m. Why... Yes. She couldn't have placed it there after that, since by then she'd been dead for several hours. Yes, of course, that must be right. Dead right, Mr. Wilson. Well, then who did put it there? The person whose fingerprints have been found on the note case. But... Th and who was also listening outside your mother's room just before 10 o'clock this morning and overheard me inform Miss Frail that the torn-off necktie was a plant and who then hurried out to the pillar box in a last desperate effort to divert suspicion. The same person, Mr. Wilson who, learning of your mother's financial crash, saw no future in marrying you unless you inherited the 20,000 pounds in charge. Helen! You won't get me! Helen! Helen, come back! It's all right. She won't get very far. You can see from the window. <laughs> Helen! Helen! It was her all the time. Now, they've caught her. She's putting up a struggle, but they've got her all right. Oh, it's too horrible. I was watching her face, Dr. Morell, while you were talking. She went absolutely white. I thought she was going to faint. It's usually Miss Frail who is so overcome. <sighs> Miss Frail! Miss Frail! She's passed out. I thought the excitement might prove too much for her. No doubt about it, Dr. Morell. The way you solved the sleepwalker case was out of this world. You are too kind, Miss Frail. I have encountered few criminals who went to such elaborate pains to cover up their tracks... Disposing of the note case in the pillar box, for instance, uh, for all her ingenuity, she found herself driven by a subconscious compulsion to overplay her hand and so encompass her self-destruction. But surely she betrayed herself by her fingerprints on the note case. I call that just plain stupid. My dear Miss Frail, uh, did I never explain that to you? How do you mean? Well, naturally, her fingerprints were on the note case. She put them there when she took it from the postman. So they proved absolutely nothing at all. But what? Bluff, my dear Miss Frail. Bluff? Just bluff, yes. It had been a long day, remember. I wanted to force a confession out of her without wasting any time so that I could get back and proceed with my work in the laboratory, which was much more important in my estimation. But, Dr. Morell... Uh, that reminds me, Miss Frail, if I may continue with dictating these notes. Yes, Doctor. Uh, where were we? Well, I was observing uh, that every criminal is motivated by an inner compulsion to bring about his self-destruction. In order to achieve this act of self-betrayal, the evildoer cannot resist from drawing attention to his own crime. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Moreau. And, of course, his secretary, Miss Frey. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Helen Keane, Moira Lister, Richard Wilson, Hugh Burton, Inspector Hood, Philip Ray. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. <laughs> listening next Saturday afternoon for another case for Dr. Morell, this time The Blackmailer.